This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today, Evan Hafer. Evan is a former Army Special Forces soldier, went to work for the Central Intelligence Agency after that, and then started Black Rifle Coffee Company in 2014. Took it public on the New York Stock Exchange less than 10 years later. Amazing guy, does a ton for veterans. And now, without further ado, Evan Haver. Evan Hafer, man, thanks for coming up, brother. Jack Carr, it's great to be here. I love it's it wonderful here. Wonderful to have you. I know it seems eerily familiar, as if I've mm. been here before, <laughs> making an offer on this place, right as you made the offer that they accepted. It's weird. I don't know. It's, it's how crazy such, is that? such a strange small world. How did we come? Up, how did we figure out that you were actually in this house? Because I knew you were looking around up here. And did I text you like all excited that, hey, we just got a new place? And you're like, oh, interesting. I forget exactly how that went down. No, because the uh, the real estate agent that mm-hmm. we were using uh, to look for places up here knew who you were. Uh, and we were here looking at the house when they accepted your offer. Man, they're like, hey, it, it's uh, your, your buddy actually just put an offer in on this. I was oh, like, man. are you serious? And I called you. I think I called yeah, yeah. you or texted you. Uh, and you I was did. like, hey, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for... Uh, and, and the market was so tight. You and I talked yeah. about it. Like, this was... We were looking for over a year trying to find a place. Yeah. We eventually just bought another... A different place in Salt Lake because yeah. we couldn't find anything up here. It got crazy there for a while. But I appreciate you not making uh, an offer um, <laughs> also because I think they might have taken yours. Uh, <laughs> no. my, that's my guess, I, especially then. I, I can't even remember. I just knew I was like, oh, man, well, like, let's uh, bust out of here. Well, well it's, cool. and it's and it's up here. Right? It it's, it, it's out. It's out here. It is. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. The kids think it's a little bit too far really uh, everything's relative because they're used to coronado california yeah, yeah, yeah where you're right there walking yeah. everywhere and right. uh seal teams you know a little bit of a tiny drive now it's a little more now they're down at the other end of imperial beach instead mm-hmm. of in coronado but everything for the kids back in coronado was walkable it was right, right there bikeable um and when i say bikeable i don't mean like you're putting in much effort it's a uh, beach cruiser bike yeah, yeah different type of deal right um then it's flat yeah it's super flat and uh and it's nice and then here park city so when we were in town still things are pretty dang close yeah uh, in park city out here we're a little out there right now but it's uh we love it we it's love nice. it nice yeah yeah nice and nice and calm you get nice and calm. elk you've got turkey you've got moose you've got everything out here i think um I wish you could, can you get tags out here? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I decided not even to look into it just because I'm going to let them yeah. run free out here. Right. And uh, if I go hunting, I'll go 45 minutes down the road yeah. or, uh, or somewhere else. Right. But yeah. I, I do actually, I, I love it up here more than in Salt Lake. Yeah. But the problem is, is that I'm 12 minutes away from the office. That's yeah. And so I'm jump on the interstate. I'm in the office. Yeah. Uh, Mm-hmm. versus 40, 50 minutes. That adds up. Yeah, two hours a day. Yeah. You know, and I'm in the office typically six days a week. So yeah. I don't I don't know if I want to do that, right? It's like 12 hours. Like, it's, it's just a lot of driving, man. And you got a lot to do. Like, you are, like me, I am running me, essentially. Um, you have a lot of people that you are responsible for. Uh, <clears throat> and, and now, not just the people that work for you, but now you have to consider shareholders oh, and yeah. all these other things. Yeah, so you've yeah. got a lot going on mm-hmm. yeah. um, where maybe that 40 minute drive, 45 minute drive, you know, maybe it helps you decompress or think things through perhaps, or yeah. maybe you're just on calls the whole time trying to, you know, avoid elk and moose in the road. Typically I think I'm on, I'm on the phone regardless. So yeah. even for that 12, 12 to 15 minutes, depending on the, on how long it takes me to get in, but I typically jump on the phone and then I'm on a call as I'm on my way to the office and then I grab a cup of coffee. Well, first thing is like I go in, grab a cup of coffee. In that Typically, front area right there? You have some, no, I, you I do. still making your own? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I make it uh, pour over every day. I made two today. 
and then I make one at the house and then one in the lab, either okay. in the very back. Okay. So I've got a lab back there yeah. or in the coffee shop. Yeah. Depending. I, I actually really like making coffee in the coffee shop because I get to talk to customers and mm-hmm. you know, people come in and you're like, What's up? Making coffee. Do you want any? And most of the time it's it's a very positive experience for me yeah. to interact with everybody. Uh, and then if I'm in the lab, it's because I have something back there mm. that I'm trying to make, but I want to be very intentional with the way that I'm making it. Right. Is, uh, and then Edwin, I think you've known mm. for quite a while, depending on what uh, what he's he's roasting. Yeah. I want, also want to pay attention to what he's well, doing. Well, I remember down in San Antonio days when I went to your yeah, house yeah. down there and you measured this. You were, it was my first time actually seeing somebody measure out coffee, weigh the coffee, like all in. Like it was... Yeah. You were you were on mission. You were on point. You were focused, and you made a great cup of coffee. It was amazing. But I came home and told my wife, you know, about that, yeah. about the process and everything, and she was just looking at me like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. "That's not happening here." You know, a funny, weird story is I was I was talking to um, Tucker Carlson. You've been out to I think his mm-hmm. his show. I went out there last year in Maine, and uh, I showed him how to make a cup of coffee. I was like, "Hey, what did he say?" Hey, like. One, he was way into it. Nice. He's way into awesome. it. Awesome. And he said, one, I mean, well, a couple of things. He's incredible to hang out with. Yeah. Like, he's really down to earth. Great guy. Normal guy. We had dinner that night with um, Don Jr. and Tucker and all, and like a couple other guys from just around the, the neighborhood there in Maine. Uh, I was just surprised as to, one, how well read, and then two, how normal. Mm-hmm. Which is oh, yeah. kind of down to earth. He drove a, you know, Chevy Silverado. He had his dogs in the in the truck and dogs, yeah. and uh, way into fly fishing, way into shotguns. I gave him a yep. black rifle AR nice. back from uh, the Novaski oh, nice. AR that we built like three or four years ago. That I've, I I gave I don't know probably I've probably given forty away in the last oh, couple nice. of years. Tucker has one. Very cool. Yeah. Tucker has one. Is it? He loved it. He texted me. So the story in this was like, he texted me probably two or three weeks ago. It was like, dude, thank you so much for showing me how to make an, a proper cup of coffee. Nice. And it's one of my favorite compliments when I hear people say, dude, thank you for making, for, for showing me how to make a, a proper cup of coffee. I never texted you that. I think mm-hmm. I was more like, thank you for teaching me how to make a proper cup of coffee. <laughs> I can never make one until all the kids are out of the house and, uh, and all that. Um, but yeah, it's just go, go, go. It is different. Yeah. It's definitely different when someone knows how to do that pour over, it's a different cup of coffee and I don't need to church it up. Like mm-hmm. I usually do with my honey and right. my half and half or cream or whatever. It's uh, you can drink that and it is a different experience than just getting the, my regular drip. Boom, go. Um, it's, it's a different cup of coffee for those who have not had a pour over. Uh, if you don't want to get sucked in and start making them, probably don't try one. Um, but, uh, but if you're into it want to, you know, give it a shot, dude, it's, it's five and a half minutes. The way I look at it, it's a ritual every morning, mm-hmm. right? It's like, it's five and a half minutes of your life. And I, uh, you know, obviously I love coffee. I have for like my entire adult life and it's something that directly enhances my life every morning. So yeah, I have a scale, I have, you know, Chemex, I have a Hario V60, you know, I used to have a super fancy espresso machines. Um, what I realized is that lower technology, I just have like a, a standard uh, gooseneck kettle, uh, little Hario scale, uh, great grinder, which is made by Fellow. Like Fellow makes some really incredible stuff for coffee. So, and this isn't a commercial for Fellow, but they make a great grinder great gooseneck cuddle nice you know and then it's hario scale chemex a super low technology uh not a huge investment you know you're talking about all in i think you know you're less than 400 bucks on on like and that is the best equipment in that world as far as pour over and it you know at one point i think i had a i don't know probably a fifteen thousand dollar espresso machine in my house i mean i'm a coffee guy right so yeah like it's okay yeah. for me to have it, but I end up just making pour overs okay. every day either way. So okay. I just, that's all I have. I have it every day. If I want an espresso, I go into the office. Uh, I make an espresso on one of three different espresso machines that we have. And 
you know, I figured it out. But espresso is yeah. not my favorite either way. So pour over is always my go-to. Well, when we do the remodel uh, here, I'll be talking to you guys and figure out what we should do mm -hmm. with that because we're going to have a coffee station and, and all that sort of a thing. Um, so I'll be talking to you then and figure out what the best uh, what the best move might be. But I remember the first time you made me one was that was not at your place in San Antonio. It was at Performance Archery oh, yeah. in San Diego. Yeah, we that's went right. out there and Dudley was out there. Yeah. Uh, he was just here a couple of days ago. So we did the podcast and we were talking about that. And we were looking at the photo in front of the limo before we went to see Rogan yeah. in San Diego after Performance Archery. That's right. And uh, we we're like, oh, my gosh, look, who's that? Is that Barklow? And there's and there's Evan. And they could, we're like, who's this person? And, they, and it was just. Uh, it was pretty cool to look back on that photo from the summer of 2018, I think, and then think about what has uh, happened to everybody in that photo <laughs> since. It was pretty cool. That is wild because that was the first time. That was the first time I met Rogan. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I met you. Yeah. Um, Jocko. And, we have Jocko there. Yeah, Jocko was there. Uh huh. We had uh, Trevor Thompson there. Wow. We had. Uh, uh, I think Andy was there for one part of it. Anyway, we had a good, gosh, we had a great crew. Yeah, that was wild, man. That yeah. was like everybody was down there because we went. Um, yep, that was the first time I met Trevor. We went to the wind tunnel, Jocko, nice. and everybody went to the wind tunnel. That was the night before Rogue under the night after. I can't remember. And um, I always <laughs> I love, I love telling this story because Jocko is exactly the way that you would think Jocko would be uh -huh. flying around in the wind tunnel. He's trying to control it, to control, <laughs> you know, like grab the air, yeah. you know, good, <laughs> good. And, um, it was, it, it was just Fantastic. watching him free fall. I was like, okay, cool. And, uh, because you know, what was going on was Dudley was moving from performance archery to go do free fall with oh, yeah, Andy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he had all those guys down there. Yeah, and then they rolled, I think. And yeah, I, yeah. And I think that's where Jocko broke Dudley's neck or something. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And then uh, Dudley didn't tell Jocko for a long time, something like that, like months like and months. And, yeah, something like yeah. that. I remember that was all a part of it. Um, and But I remember exactly where you were, right between the uh, the shop part and the range part, in yeah. the little corner. You had all your bags. You had, you're grinding with that little, you know, the black uh, yeah, yeah. hand grinder. Yeah. And then you made me a cup of coffee right there. Yeah. And it was awesome. That's right. I, I totally remember now like that. I'll have to pull up those pictures, those pictures. Yeah. That yeah. Fun. That was really cool. That I was did, really cool. Oh yeah. I invited you to go uh, jump in Normandy with us, but you said, no, your jumping days are over. Well, I'll be there. I think I'll be there with my daughter, um, escorting a veteran yeah. also. So <clears> I think, you know, those, it's going to be the 80th anniversary edition and it's just so powerful to spend time with those guys. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them won't make it to 80, no. 80 first. Um, so I'm going to be attached to mm -hmm. somebody down there anyway. So, uh, not that I'm thrilled to say yes to jumping out of planes anymore. I think, <laughs> I think I've had sufficient. I think I'm yeah. good. I think I've moved on from that. Um, did you like uh, it? I liked the jumping and the flying around. Okay. I hated the anticipation mm -hmm. on the way up right? and like pre-breathing and all that. And then yeah. I did not like the pull because I love flying around. Wonderful. Yeah. And then, cause you're now is the moment of truth. Right. And when you pull, it's either like, this is going to work. I'm going to look up, I'm gonna have a canopy. Yeah. Everything's going to be great. And now I'm going to look for other jumpers and do my sure. thing. Uh, or you're going to have a malfunction. Right. In which case, depending on the type of malfunction, you're going to have to cut away, untangle, whatever you're going to need to do yeah. you know, through these certain procedures. Right. Um, so I didn't like that part right. Time to pull. Yeah. And, but then I liked being under canopy. So, so I like parts I didn't like other parts. The parts that I didn't like, uh, I think, uh, are the reasons that I, I'm good now. Like, right. it's fine. Yeah. I don't need to be jumping out of planes or jumping off cliffs or jumping off bridges or anything like that. It's great. Yeah. I love watching those videos of people doing it. Uh, but I'm probably good. Right. It's a good run. Did you have any malfunctions? Uh, did I have any malfunctions? We had two guys killed in my free fall class. In what? Yuma. Instructor and a student hit each other, um, both... I mean, tracking at towards night? each other at night. Yeah. yeah. Last, uh, second to last jump. Okay. Meaning we couldn't graduate because we had one more night. This right. was, I think, I forget how many you had to do, but this was uh, uh, oxygen, pre breathe, combat equipment, night. Was that, that Yuma? Stuff. Yuma. Yeah. Okay. The Army course. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they collided, hit heads. Uh, and so we got wow. online and then uh, went through the desert looking for them. Right. And, uh, and found him in the desert and then there had to be an investigation. So I think the investigation took, it seems fast now saying that it was only maybe two weeks. Mm -hmm. So they kept us in Yuma for that whole time, just in the barracks. So we just worked out waiting. 
for this investigation right. to finish because we had one more jump to do and we right. had the memorial service and yeah. we had the whole thing. And so that's all part of it. And in the lead up to that, before jump school, uh, one of my best friends in the SEAL teams got killed on a jump. And then they put me and one other guy who were like best, we've all gone to Buds together, through Hell Week together, got to our first same team together, um, and uh, did our first platoon, and we were in sister platoons, but we trained up, meaning we trained up together, but went mm -hmm. different places on that deployment, came back, he went to free fall, and he burned in. And that, that what next happened? week, uh, he had a, some sort of a malfunction. Okay. Yeah, some sort of a malfunction, uh, and he couldn't untangle, and yeah, burned in. Wow. So, uh, so the next week, which might have been a little soon, but now looking back on it, uh, I, I get it. And so they sent me and the guy that were best friends. Yeah. You guys are going to free fall. Wow. Roger that. Roger that. So, uh, I yeah, we went to Bragg for that because Bragg yeah. was one of the only places that had a, a wind tunnel back mm -hmm. then. They weren't all over the country yet. Yeah, they yeah. weren't those, you know, the eye flies, whatever yeah. they're called. So we went to Bragg for a week and that was cool being yeah. on Bragg for a week. It was awesome seeing the, uh, army training <laughs> and, uh, and I love the special forces museum there that yeah. they had. Like that was so cool for Did me. You go to the small one. I went to the small the GFK one. one. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was really cool. I think they had the, uh, diorama sand table mm -hmm. of the, uh, Sante Ray. Oh, yeah. I think was there, uh, to see the statues. Like I loved, uh, that was really cool for me to, to see that. Um, so did the wind tunnel, very different than actually flying. Right. Um, and uh, then we went to Yuma for the next three weeks, four weeks, right. whatever, whatever it was. But what yeah, year was that? 2000. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was there. Yeah, 2000. And, uh, but anyway, we did, so we had a round investigation concluded. We went up and we did that, that final jump, that final night combat equipment jump. And we were good after that. So well, you probably don't have a lot of what I would say is positive psychology built around that either no, way. It's not, <clears throat> no, it's so, uh, yeah. I was yeah, I'm good. You're good. Yeah. 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 Did the did the jumps and for me it was a means of uh, a means of insertion of getting into a place if we sure. needed to, to use it or get to a boat or whatever we mm -hmm. needed to do. Uh, and then now that I don't do that anymore. What good. what do you do recreationally? Like what, what's I write, your, I write and, uh, and podcast. No, no, that, that's, that's not, that's not a recreation. What do you like? Cause this is work. I look at that gym outside. Oh, that's um, cool. So I look at that. Yeah. Um, sling a few arrows every now and again, but, uh, no, right now it's all, it's still about, let's say it's either work or family. Mm -hmm. So canceled all the hunts last year, canceled right. all the hunts this year again, yep. cause there's just so much going on. Um, from the outside looking in someone who would probably tell me that you need to maybe take a breath and go do some other things, but not right now. It's right. Not, it's not time for that. It's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get back to it. But right now I love writing. Yeah. I love doing all these other things that, so all the supporting efforts for those right. military people that are listening, the supporting main effort is writing. Everything else is the supporting mm -hmm. effort to that. But, uh, still in that phase, just like, just like you were as, uh, okay, I am the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, the social media manager. Yeah. Uh, and I have this product and this product is this coffee that I love, mm -hmm. uh, like day one, week one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now you have obviously grown way past that. And I think it's time now for me to grow out of that garage, like, uh, yeah. and, uh, and move into a, a place where I have a couple of people that are helping me do the things that I don't need to do. That's mm -hmm. the next stage so that I can focus on the writing, but it frees up some of those supporting efforts that I might not need to be as intimately involved with so that I can do other things. Right. Uh, but we're not, not quite there what, yet. What, what do you aspire to do recreationally outside of like, what are some aspirational recreations that you would, well, Getting in the mountains, hunting. Yeah. That's uh, that's the main one now. It used to be back in the day when I was training for something. It'd be mm -hmm. trail running and it right. would be any sort of functional fitness type stuff, anything that was going to make me a better operator. Um, so now that's different. Now it's getting out in the backcountry with the kids. Um, and now it's, you know, sometimes they're not going to be able to go on certain things that, uh, that I can because of school or, uh, races for skiing or whatever else they have, they have going on. And a lot of those things I, I want to be there for. Um, but, uh, I think going forward, it's going to mostly be hunting. Mm. It's going to be uh, river rafting yeah. things where I don't have my phone, right. uh, where I'm off, uh, off the grid where I'm uh, not off my phone because I choose to be, but because I have to be because right. in the bottom of river Canyon, uh, we're going to head out next week and we're going uh, to middle fork. Oh yeah. Uh, salmon. So we're going to do that with the family. You're next doing week. the whole family. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Doing that whole thing. So seven days, I think. Are you doing uh, self, self guided nope, or no, with oars? Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I've been going with them for a, a long, long time. My, yeah. my, uh, my parents went with them back in the sixties. 
when they first started it, wow. when uh, George Went started it yeah. back in the, uh, not the actor, but the uh, the guide, uh, back in the 60s. So uh, been a part of my family and history for a long time. So right. we're gonna go do that together. My wife and I did it right before September 11th, 2001, mm -hmm. uh, August before deployment. They give you like two weeks for those yeah. listening of like pre-deployment leave, I think they called it. So you have two weeks or a week beforehand. And so my wife and I did it in 2001, um, August 2001. And uh, then came back, went on deployment, and then September 11th happened. So I haven't been back on the Middle Fork. I've been on the Main Fork. Been, we've done a bunch of other rivers together. You haven't been on the Middle Fork since then? Mm -mm. Huh. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. it'd be crazy. crazy. Yeah, my, my, so the Middle Fork of the Salmon, which is like, to, to provide context to those who don't know, it's, so the Salmon is the, lo the longest free-flowing river in the continental United States. It doesn't have any, any dams. It's one of the only rivers that still has um, uh, essentially a, a, a boat that you can put in from the top, and it will float all the way down to the bottom based on current. Um, it built originally off something called a scow. Uh, I don't know if you're, mm -mm. you've ever heard of a, a scow. No. Um, and it, it has essentially an oar in front and an oar in the back. Mm. And that's how it's, you know, the, basically a, you're rowing a big gear boat down the, the middle fork. But there's not a row. It's just a guide oar in front and a guide mm. oar in back. Yeah. And it goes straight out. So whereas, like, if you were to turn the oars and put them on the front of a boat, one on the front, one on the back. So you're just guiding the current as you're moving down. And then you can pack a lot of weight in that. Um, it's, it's a, it's an interesting experience. I mean, yeah, the, the, the middle fork of the salmon is in the Frank church wilderness area, which is also the, the most remote wilderness area in the lower 48. So it's the longest free flowing river and it's the most remote wilderness yeah. area. Um, it's a beautiful river. It's actually my favorite place on, on the planet. It's actually my favorite yeah. place on the planet. We yeah. absolutely, I remember when we were on last time we yeah. did the, the main and you saw, I, I posted a picture or yeah. I sent you a picture and, uh, and you're like, what you were on that, on the river you didn't yeah. tell me. So we, uh, we, my daughter just got off the main. She just did, did, a, did a trip. Yeah. She just did a trip right there. She wants, uh, she wants to get a raft, uh, yeah. a catamaran type. And, yeah. uh, so I, I have a, like we're going to go up uh, to Idaho. What's the company in Idaho that makes the raft? Northwest River Supplies. What's the one that was the actual raft? It starts with an M. Oh, Moravia. Yeah. yeah I'm gonna, so we're going to go get her one of, yeah. one of those. And she really likes it. She's, I mean, she's, she's been on the river since she did the, gosh, what did she start with? Rogue, I think, when yeah. she was maybe five okay. or something like yeah. that. So with a kayak in the front, right. just an inflatable uh, and me kayaking. Uh, so she's been on rivers for, for a long time. She's got kind of a good feel for it. You can mm -hmm. just tell when you're just watching her oh, set yeah. up for things that she's like in her element, not nervous, um, you know, confident, but still reading things. And, and anyway, it's really cool to, to see. So, yeah, so we're going to go do that. I had to cancel one for September just because there's too much going on. We're yeah. going to do one on our own, um, not with the company, in September. Where at? Um, on the main. Oh, cool. And we were going to, but I'm going to have to cancel. There's too much yeah. Too much happening, unfortunately. But, yeah, uh, but yeah we did one on, uh, on our own there a couple of years back. Uh, right at the beginning of COVID, I think in May of mm -hmm. 2020, we went out there and did one on our own, just with friends, um, a guide around here who's done it for, for years and years and years. So, right. um, the Silvics shout out to the Silvics. Um, and, but we, I love it. Point being you're in the bottom of a river canyon. Yeah. There's no, there's not even the option of not me going like, option. Oh, hold on. Uh, I just yeah. got to return this real quick. Yeah. And cause I hate when I do yeah. that and I know, uh, so uh, bottom river canyon no service no wi-fi obviously and then same thing a lot of places that uh that we hunt same thing mm -hmm. like there's no uh no cell service and i love that being in the backcountry well one of the last hunts i did was up in alaska and uh in the wrangles and man it was so Where's beautiful that up there and uh geez uh I don't even do, Alaska is so big. I know that it's, I'm gonna it's screw like the up size exactly of Texas or something. It or more. is, right. but uh, the the way to, we got there was flying to Anchorage, uh, about a five hour drive to a little dirt strip. Get in the plane, plane to another dirt strip deeper into the mm -hmm. into the backcountry, and then horses you know, from there from a from a camp there uh, for about a, a day. Uh, get a little farther wow. in there and. It's just beautiful. You're off there on your own, and and uh, it was a great, great hunt. Once again, no cell service, right? So it was fantastic. And I, I did uh, try to bring my well, I did bring my computer, and I bought the big, not the biggest, but a large solar charging thing. Yeah, that I thought yeah, yeah. that I would do some writing out there, and yeah, I didn't really. It's just mm -hmm. yeah, anything, anything uh, that grounds you to the to the electronic world, whether you have Wi-Fi or not, it just does, it seems a little bit out of place. It out does, there, you know. Yeah, 
<clears throat> I think the well, we did our bear hunt up there two years ago, three years ago. When I, I don't know, three years it looked ago. looked amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, you know, myself, Matt, Logan, Jared couldn't go because he's fat and he doesn't like to do stuff like that. And, um, well, yeah, the invite that was, you know, yeah, he likes his, uh, you know, he likes white bread and, and his nitrates and hot dogs. You know, he's not going to do those types of things. I thought he was getting in shape. What happened? No, he, um, was that after that? Didn't he go on some sort of a yeah. health kick? I don't know. He goes, he goes in and out of health, mm. you know, he'll, he'll be somewhat healthy for a short amount of time. Yeah. He'll lose like 20 or 30 pounds mainly because I'll ridicule him to the point where, cause it, publicly and privately. Yeah. Yeah. I fat shame the shit out of him yeah. because like that, it's still kind of like NCO rules for, around. His, for his own good. Yeah. It's yeah. NCO rules around the business, especially for the partners, not, not with employees. Obviously it doesn't fly because there's a lot of things that could go wrong. But now. Partners. Yeah. <laughs> they're right there. I could, I could, I still get to scuff them up. Like, well, you know, well, I bet JT in Missoula in 2000. That's crazy. And, uh, five, 2005, I think Missoula. Yeah. Yeah. W- weren't you getting the back of a striker yeah, or something like that? Getting the back of the striker yeah. and getting dropped off to, uh, we're actually searching for an Iraqi sniper. There was a bunch of, of, uh, U S soldiers and, uh, Iraqi, um, army that were getting shot in the head. Yeah. And I guess it wasn't that a typical profile, uh, for attacks on, uh, on allied forces up there. And so they had us come up and see if we could hunt down this, what they thought was someone who had escaped from Abu Ghraib, mm-hmm. uh, who had some, you know, whether he was a sniper or not, or just had a rifle that had a scope on it. Right. Like, like who knows, but, but he did uh, do enough damage to cause senior level leaders to say, hey, how, how can we stop this? Right. And so we went up there and we tried to create these different uh, kind of scenarios where he might show himself and... Didn't and find it, him? No, no. He did stop, though. Yeah, he did. That, yeah, while we, were, while we were up there. So whether it was just... He was moving on somewhere else, or right. he just decided to hang it up and retire, right. or he was in a car accident, or like, who knows. But uh, but it did stop once we were up there, so huh. we came back and went back to our mission after about a month, I think. But yeah, JT in the uh, in the back of a of a striker, two thousand five in uh, in northern Iraq. God, yeah. that's that's wild. Yeah, crazy. I was there in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So I was there later. Yeah, it's an interesting spot. There's some beautiful spots up there. You, the farther you go north in Iraq, mm-hmm. there, especially in the springtime when there's uh, there's some. Th- th- things are uh, not as dry and yeah. it's, it's, it can be there's some beautiful spots just like Afghanistan there's some beautiful spots and in both countries there's some nasty spots you know you know how it goes it, it the majority of of the you know of Iraq was just really not not that appealing you know if you get up to like so yeah, many south uh, and stuff did you go south ever yeah yeah I was in Basra I did, I did a, yeah not, I don't, it's, it's just so hot it's like 138 degrees yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a dry there. heat though I don't even know this one, trying. this one was because you're, you're close to the ocean and you're and we're right on the it's called the El Shot Arab, which is mm. this, uh, the uh, the El Shot. <laughs> it's kind of a shitty river, but it was a is a fairly expansive river, and everything was so humid. Yeah, it was humid. Yeah, and it was like 138 degrees. I can't even remember it right right now. Like talking about, I say dry heat, like I'm just joking, like people say about Arizona. <sighs> But I can't even remember, and I was there during the summer. Oh. Uh, some things I've blocked out. I, 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 I truly believe. I remember it was hot. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I do have a residual, uh, like a, a, a anxiety response to heat. Yeah, I do because I, I was just miserable for yeah. you know essentially two thousand two until two thousand nine ish when I left. Oh. Uh, and Baghdad, July, dude, is horrible. Oh, I, awful, awful. And like the the only thing I could think of, like all the time, was um, it's way too hot. Please let let's not have let's let's not get in this ambush. Like I don't want to get this warm. extended tick right here. Yeah. Like I'm really sick. Troops in contact. Sit, yeah, I don't really want to sit here and just get my ass handed oh, to me. Man. Like I'd rather just not do that right now. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, when you're doing the ambushing, it's a little bit, little bit easier psychologically. But I really just didn't want to be yeah. stuck. I yeah. was like, I, I don't really want to be stuck here. You yeah. know, like yeah. duking it out. I don't really like it. Service isn't just what Navy Federal Credit Union does; it's who they are. That's why Navy Federal created tools to help you earn and save more. 
Make your financial goals a reality with great rates and low fees. Members enjoy earnings and savings of $473 per year by banking with Navy Federal. An average credit card APR that's 6% lower than the industry average. A market-leading regular savings rate nearly two times the industry average. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash offers. I've been a member of Navy Federal since I enlisted in the Navy in 1996 and have had nothing but positive experiences with them for what is now closing in on 30 years. Wherever we were stationed, whether at home or abroad, Navy Federal was by our side. Navy Federal has made it their mission to help military members and their families tackle home ownership. With their new no refi rate drop option, you can buy a home now. And if rates drop later, you can then lower your rate without refinancing. Plus, they also offer mortgage options with zero down payment. So you don't need to wait years to save at Navy Federal. Our members are the mission. Find out more at NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, membership required, equal housing lender, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. NavyFederal.org. Well, you know, talking about, so Baghdad, uh, the next year, so 2006, Mm -hmm. um, before the summer, not bad. Not bad. I liked liked it. Um, But you know what stands out to me? That deployment is the coffee. Because yeah. I was attached to your former employer over yeah. there at the agency, and uh, there was good. I have this. It just I didn't do it iced. It was still warm. Yeah. You know? um, but uh, yeah, big old styrofoam cup. Probably not people now. You're probably like there's all sorts of chemicals in the styrofoam, whatever. But the biggest styrofoam cup, whatever they were making in that little galley cafeteria thing yeah. at the agency's little yeah. special place there. Yeah. I mean, I would fill that up at, at lunch. And I put in uh, Splenda, I remember. And then I had <laughs> a couple Splenda. Is Splenda the one that's, what, what's the pink one? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't Splenda ever or, use. Splenda uh, or yellow? I don't know. Because they had that stuff out there. I right? don't even use any of that stuff. Yeah. No, I don't anymore. But back yeah. then, styrofoam cup. Yeah. Super hot coffee, which oh, was perfect. fantastic. Yeah. I don't know what they had there. And then um, very different than the regular coffee in the normal galleys. But then whatever was in the uh, pink packets. Whatever yeah, whatever. I think, so that is, those, I think that is. Uh, is it Splenda? Or I think it is. Yeah. I think it is Splenda. Isn't Splenda Stevia yellow? Stevia or one of those. I don't know. Yeah, it was whatever the pink one was. Probably the worst one for you, I'm guessing, whatever that was. So two or three of those, and then the uh, amaretto-flavored... Creamer? Yeah. Yeah. And I would just, boom, big one of those, and then fill it up again before I'd wander my way back to the the, the agency little building area thing that we had. Um, That was good. I had great, great memories of that. I, love, I can taste it right now. Mm, it, interesting. Yeah. I don't know what coffee it was because back then I wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, this is 2006, so yeah. it was, wasn't was something you were you would ask. You know, I, I wasn't like, what kind of coffee is this? I'm trying to think. I was in, um, I was in Kirkuk in 2006. So I was in Baghdad in 2005 at the uh, RPC. So I was at VVIP RPC out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, what was that area? Was that Area 15 or? I think so, but I'm you not positive. That? Yeah, you remember out the airport. Yeah, yeah. Where, uh-huh. um, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly where that was. But yeah, I was there 2005 because we did the Invasion 3. So that was March 2003. Then Baghdad 05. Then Kirkuk 06. Uh, Sulaymaniyah. The Hook. You did the full tour. And then back down to Basra, and then um, uh, Mosul was on my last. No, you know what? I went uh, Mosul and then Basra. Basra was when we mm. signed the SOFA, so the Status of Forces Agreement. I was in Basra. Okay. So that's when uh, I yeah. left and went to Afghanistan three weeks later. Well, let's bring everybody in on... Uh, so did you grow up all, only in Idaho, or would you guys move around? Did you. No, just Idaho. So yeah, Idaho. yeah, yeah. When did you start river rafting? When did that come in? Um, college. Okay. Uh, like I, I, I grew up on the confluence of two rivers. So I grew up in Lewiston, Idaho, on the Clearwater. Um, there's just two rivers right there. It's the okay. Clearwater and the Snake. Um, and my girlfriend at the time, her dad was really into jet boats. Okay, um, and. Uh, the Bentz family, if uh, if anybody is from Lewiston, Idaho. Uh, in the Bentz family, there was uh, two brothers. 
um, Daryl and Rusty Bents, and they were essentially the fathers of jet boating in, oh, nice. in I think, in the United States. Okay. Uh, and they they kind of were the, the catalyst to me spending a lot of time on the river. And then I started kind of just really spending more time going down or up. And that's, to this day, I still, uh, you know, I'm part owner in a, in a rafting company. I have been since 2009-ish. Uh, Idaho River Adventures. I have a jet boat. So I, nice. I, I like either one, you know. I like rowing boats. It's a lot of fun yeah. for me. It's a different experience than uh, driving them up yeah. or down, depending. Like, right. uh, you know, my my thing is is just spending as much time as I can recreationally. I, I don't have a lot of time, just much like you. But my recreational aspirations would be to spend as much time as possible in rivers. Absolutely. Have you done the right. Selway? Oh yeah. Have uh, you? Yeah, I did that in my kayak. Uh, no way. So I started. I, I think that's what I start. So technically, I started kayaking whitewater kayaking first and then okay moved into other bigger Man. bigger boats that is awesome yeah that is awesome i've kayaked a few different you know i, I i'm not good uh, my role is like a survival role yeah. only one direction right um and i haven't done it in years you're not so an ambi roller not, no you're not an ambi roller no but i didn't yeah. spend enough time doing it um yeah. but i love it i yeah. absolutely love it and uh i'd like to do it again and get back into that. That's when you ask about recreational yeah. stuff, being on the river, um, they're doing the kayak thing. I think I need to spend a little more time in the gym though. Before I do that. <laughs> yeah. But, I know uh, you're going to, we're going to blow out shoulders. Exactly. And like, yeah, dude, that's, that's why I'm kind of like, man, did I miss my window on that? I've yeah. always loved it. I've done it. I spent a lot of time in the, uh, when I was at DLI, I'd go up to the, uh, the American river. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Forks up there. American do, fork, right? Yeah. Uh, do, uh, do classes with, uh, it was California canoe and kayak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. California yeah. canoe and kayak. So I do, uh, courses with them up there mm-hmm. when I was at defense language Institute. Um, what'd you take? What was your language? French. Oh, uh, est-ce que vous comprenez le français? Oh, jeez. It's all gone. I did a, <laughs> what did they want you to graduate with? A two, two, yeah, two. Yeah, two plus two plus, right? I did the plus. So I was one above what they wanted okay. to do. Okay. Because they were going to send me to North Africa, West Africa for yeah. some stuff. To and Senegal. So I did go. Uh, went to you Ma- did? To Mali. Oh. But, uh, wow. but I had a, a chirp the whole time. Right. So I did not use, because uh, they had dialect and they had, anyway, they had multiple languages. Right, and, yeah. And all that, so it didn't make sense for me to... Anyway, I had a I had a subject matter expert there doing Correct. the speaking. Yeah. Uh, so my French, I think I could get it back, but it's not there. It's not there right now. Spanish is gone. Had that growing up, but that's gone too. They, they were, when I went to DLI, they morphed for a little bit together because oh, yeah. the Spanish came back. Right. But then it mixed with the French. And so for the first month of that six month course, I was just all over the place. Maybe the first two months. And then well, they're both like technically they're both like Latin root languages, right? So, but you won't. But yeah, but you, uh, my French, it was it was a, it was a mess. And uh, but then it, then it, for whatever reason, just boom, cleared up. So they yeah. morphed together for a little bit, and then the Spanish went away, and the French came up, mm. and then now they're both gone. So Were you there for a year or six months? Six months. Yeah, yeah six months, and then over to, to to Germany, and then down to down to Africa for that. Right that mission thing but uh and then right back to the seal teams so yeah i did too much i did thai ah but i never went to thailand and but but i ended up going to senegal martania so that's where i with the army or with uh with the agency yes man and then botswana oh did you spend some time yeah i did okavango so i did just south of the okavango uh, training the Botswana Defense Force guys to uh, counter poaching operations. So oh, nice! That was a lot of fun. Dang, um, that's a good run. Well, how many? Growing up, when you're uh, in Idaho, uh, at what point do you become aware of Army Special Forces, Green Berets? Is it from movies? Rambo, from, dude. Yeah, Rambo. From like, which movie? From Rambo First Blood. Rambo Part First two? Blood. No, yeah, yeah, Rambo First Blood. Right. Like, so that did, was it. So you saw First Blood yeah. first, and then you saw Rambo First Blood Part Two. Yes. So uh, that was it. Like I was hooked. And uh, that's why, you know, I wanted to be a Green Beret. That was it. Man. Uh, did you do like, some more research or did you just rely on the film? No, I, I later in life, uh, well, I should say, so the genesis is, I, I was, you know, just my, much like a lot of, you know, younger, I guess, kids and boys, right? It's just, you know, fascinated by Natural everything draw. commando. Oh, yeah. Um, and then... um that 
that that was right around my time was you know obviously the rambo series was so important i think for so many different kids it was probably one of the best recruiting vehicles we ever had yeah. um but then another one of my friends um i met him uh he i went to school with his daughter and then he was a green beret oh wow and so you knew somebody yeah well and that that was truly what what was the the turning point so i was uh i I couldn't necessarily differentiate between commandos or whom did what at what points like it didn't really matter because obviously when you're when you're a young kid you don't really understand the difference between like rangers navy seals and force recon guys like okay whatever it's all kind of the same um i ended up i was in the basement of my friend's house and we were hanging out I was I, I was a junior in high school. I had a uh, a book in my back pocket called "Good to Go" Good to by go. Harry Constance, huh. who's a former he's a former SEAL. Uh, fuck, like amazing! I can still remember that. To be yeah, honest with you. I'm surprised I don't um, have that one. Uh, and uh, he asked me, he's like, "Hey, what, what's that book?" And I was like, "It's about Navy SEALs. It's pretty sweet, man. It's like these guys are super badass." And uh, he's like, "Oh, let me see that thing." He took it. Yeah, exactly. Fucking chucked it in the garbage can, basically. And then was like, here's the history of special forces from, you know, basically 1943, uh, which was the established, uh, give or take a couple of years from 1943 to 1980. It was written by um, Colonel Sutherland. And there's, it's way out of print from, mm. I think I might've bought the last two that ever existed. Mm. And uh, he gave me this book, and it was basically the size of an encyclopedia. And um, I s- started going through that and realized, like, wow, these guys are pretty interesting. You know, you get to learn a different language. Nice. Uh, I was I was really f- fascinated by their by, with, and through covert action, working with indigenous forces, uh, the entire uh, romance. Necess- I, I guess it's probably it's a. It's, it's romanticized in the in the way that of working with the Hmong, for instance, um, and then being able to fight the Viet Cong, you know, via a, a very remote and austere locations, yeah. and then you know going back to the the OSS and the Jedburg teams and working yeah. with the French resistance. It was all in that book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> like everything about that just fascinated me. Mm-hmm. Like I, I wanted to learn another language. I wanted to, like, eventually do covert action. That's what I wanted to do. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to, because we, when I when I joined, I joined in college, and there wasn't really a war going on. This is ninety five. Okay. There's the Clinton era. You know the chances of us going to war at that point were essentially <coughs> zero. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of course there were police actions when we call them police actions. I don't know, but unconventional warfare, low intensity conflict happening all around yeah. the world at all points in time. The flashpoints. Yeah. Desert one, Panama, yeah. Grenada, Mogadishu. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but did you think that when you got in that pager, bam, off we go. Like this is, well, I'm no. in. Oh, you really, you knew yeah. it was peacetime and you're kind of going to be just waiting for something well, to kick off. I, yeah, I figured there was peacetime and that ultimately I would have a lot of different training experiences yeah. that would lead to interesting adventures in your life. But I didn't have an expectation that we were going to be at war because it just didn't register that yeah. we were going to be at war until I think it was probably later in life when we were at the Q course and we we really got the full brief. You know, like this was... Um, AQI, this is Bin Laden. Um, and I was in Louisiana. I was at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. I was going through a training exercise. So we'd done a helo cast into the, into the tributary of uh, the Mississippi and the Pearl River. So we took 160th down there, uh, pushed some boats in the water, and then took them up, and we're doing a recce mission for training yeah, and that was when September 11th oh wow so the planes hit and we we're I was in a prisoner holding detention in the middle of a barge in the swamp uh, and the 
you know, cadre came down. They're like, listen, uh, you know, we're pulling you out of the scenario. And uh, we weren't like, I'd been living in the swamp. I was naked, like basically in a loincloth. I was had uh, little flip flops made out of 550 cord and a um, MRE box. I was in a prison cell. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was like, okay, well, and as soon as the plane set, we're like, we're going to fucking war. Like that was it. We knew it. But how far, how long were you out of the Q course at that point? Three months. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So you with your first, uh, so how did, what, what did you do before Q course? What was that lead up? I was that infantry guy. And then, um, I went to selection. That was it. Like I was a, I was a mechanized infantry guy. So it was like oh. the guy that rode around in the back of, it's called a Bradley fighting vehicle. It's an 11 mic. The Bradley right. fighting vehicle is legit. It's legit. Like I, I to be fair, I wish I would have had those in the invasion because that twenty five millimeter cannon. Oh yeah, <laughs> that and thing, the coax. I'm like, a huge fan, dude. It, uh, summer August two thousand four, uh, Najaf. So uh, it was a two week campaign. Our sniper team was there for eleven days of that campaign, uh -huh. but. Those Bradley, we're moving Bradleys and Abrams and uh, two seven Cav. Mm -hmm. Like it was amazing uh, to be involved with that, but to be in the back of that thing. But you don't really know in the back. You're not sure where where you are, and it's just like because it's it's tracked, yeah. and you're like moving, and it really for me anyway. I don't know if it's true for everybody else, um, but uh, I haven't I didn't spend that much time in them. I think that might have been my first time in one. I I'm not positive, but. Uh, it's moving around you're kind of yeah. like zzz, 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 and you're in the back and you're like Bleh. and then the door drops and for us yeah you plan it out ahead of time what you're yeah. going to do but still when you look at a map or look at some satellite imagery and then uh when you're driving in you're hearing what's going on outside and there's mortars and rpgs and pkm and ak fire and then that door drops and you're like oh middle of the day <laughs> yeah. and there's a firefight house and you rush out and you're yeah, like, yeah, like kind of where and it's a city so yeah. the echoes of a gunfire and everything so it's, it's disorienting but when that friggin thing kicks off and they're like D -d 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 25 friggin awesome the 25 mic mic is like that's legit man it is super legit and then you pair that with the abrams and you're like mm -hmm. oh man Doosh. like it's like it's some of my favorite memories of the war are you know obviously you know they're there, there's lots of highs and lows, but some of my favorite memories are just like one, the implementation of, of, you know, mechanized, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the mechanized element, like not just Humvees, but, you know, tanks and strikers and mm -hmm. the, the, the fire superiority element of war is like when you have fire superiority, there's actually no better feeling yeah. than having superior firepower there's fucking no better feeling when you're like raining mortars down and then you're you're just watching things burn to the ground and you're watching your enemies like just die in place there's very few things that i'm actually emotionally uh look back on with such fond memories of just fire superiority and knowing how good that feels mm. and when you have what i would say is like um tactical hegemony it's fucking amazing <laughs> like it's fucking amazing this is true you add some yeah. air to that those yeah. those abrams and those bradleys and uh infantry on the ground yeah. snipers whatever and then you add some air to that during the day and you see them you hear them come in whether it's helo or it's fixed wing um and then at night ac 130 overhead raining it down um yeah that's a pretty good feeling yeah it, it's it's like when, when you it's this orchestra of violence, which is quite one of the, the most superb feelings that I think a man could ever experience. And I think on the invasion, uh, the first exposure to that was, you know, we were waiting to go over and, you know, we're, we're, we're getting scuds and like, you know, and, and, you know, every now and again, you'll hear something. We're just like waiting for anticipation. You cross the berm. And you're moving forward and you're, you know, your anticipation as to what's going to go on. We're ahead of the 101st. Uh, you don't exactly know what's going to happen. Uh, but then once you see the orchestra, like when you see the actual American military machine and the orchestra of violence against your enemy, it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. And to be fair, I think to just be part of that and to see it and to actually feel it, to be a witness to it. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's a, it's one of those things that 
you look back on and knowing what that feels like and actually trying to empathize with the enemy in a certain regard, which is like, I would not want to be on the receiving end of this. Like it, it was terrifying to think about. Mm-hmm. It was, it was absolutely amazing at the same time. It was terrifying thinking about like, if I was on the other end of this, what, mm-hmm. what would I be thinking? Yeah. What would I be feeling if I was on the other end of this? Because it's a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they, that's right. Describe it as a feeling because it is when you when you're uh, when those Bradleys are humming, and the Abrams is there, and then air is coming over, and you've got your M4, you got your AW gunner there, whatever. You're moving to high ground, and all this is happening. It is a feeling, um, but uh, but also the other side of that is that when you see something get hit, I don't know if you had this experience when you see something get hit with like a let's say a 500 pound or something, yeah. something huge, yeah. um, and you're like, oh, no way, anyone living through no that. way. No. And then some and then guy they, runs and out. And then they run out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, what? You're like, like, how? Exactly. How is this possible? The resilience yeah. of yeah. like the human body. Yeah. Um, and it, it's so strange. And then, you know, then one round can, can kill somebody. We, it's just, it's, I, wow. I reigned like 120s all night, like on this position, just like fucking rained them and just like watch this, this section of the city just burn. And then you, you move in the next day, which was like one of the, 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 one of my favorite memories, because I mean, we know, we knew where they were. We knew exactly what we were doing. Uh, this wasn't, you know, there, there weren't going to be any civilian casualties and we we're just raining one twenties on them all fucking night. And, and then you go in, you're like, how, how did you, <laughs> How did yeah. you get it? How did you get out of this? Right. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's really interesting. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And, uh, I'm trying to like, you know, coalesce that you're like, that doesn't like, yeah. to be fair, you know, eating a pancake or, uh, 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 where there's a pound. It's like one of those the pound MRE cake, MRE pound pancakes. Cakes? Yeah, dude. Like eating one of those and like watching this, like, uh, you know, and at that point in time, it was uh fat and in watching their their compound just like go up in flames as yeah. you're raining 120s on them, you're like, man, this is, this is pretty cool. Man, I, I could do this. I can do this. Were you making coffee even back then? Oh, the yeah. Asian time frame. Yeah. Where, where did that start then? Where did the coffee start? Oh, uh, Seattle, '97. I was trying to, I was I was trying to get to know this barista that I met, and I was going to the U, the University of Washington there, and and uh, I wanted to meet this barista. And uh, she was cool, but espresso was a lot cooler. Mm. And uh, and I kind of fell in love with it there. And I was, uh, I, 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 we had these inverters on the Humvees. I don't know if you guys had them, like in the passenger side, where you you could plug in there. a bunch of different shit. So yeah. for the most part, I was a comms guy, so yeah. I could like plug in battery chargers and whatnot. But I had actually brought coffee grinders. And I was plugging in my coffee grinders and grinding coffee and making so, French press. So invasion, you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the invasion, I was making French press coffee. Okay. When we could. Yeah. And I mean, you have time, right? It's not like, you know, we, we didn't shower for, you know, uh, I think the first month. And we were living out of the back of the trucks with bottled water. Mm-hmm. Um, but you got time. You got time to make coffee. Like... There's always a little bit of time to make coffee. You're not like nice. running and gunning the entire time. You get a little bit, get a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of pause. We're 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 just south of Baghdad in Karbala. I don't know if you ever went down there, and uh, Karbala Gap is what it was called. And there's a big dust storm on the invasion that kind of halted everybody. Uh, I remember before we were rolling into Baghdad, yeah. and um, we were all uh, it's kind of like a little special operations like convention down in the Karbala gap, all of us waiting to kind of like finish the final push into Baghdad. And, and uh, you're just kind of fucking around basically. So you're making coffee. Yeah. Making coffee, man, man. And so how long are you there for that invasion then? Uh, I was there for the first six months, I guess, before I went, went back home. And then you come home and then do you, you get ready to go again or what's your, yeah. What's your well, I had, I, I tore my, I, I, I tore my right medial gastroc. So it actually, what is it? just a muscle tear. Huh. Uh, I was like, you know, driving around in a Humvee, not drinking any water, getting out and fucking running up a bunch of stairs and clearing buildings. I just I had a tear in my calf. Mm. So it took six months to recover off of that. 
Did you do surgery? Uh, no, I just had PT and mm. um, it was an ultra, uh, like ultrasound therapy and uh, PT. And then I went down to Fort Bragg and took a couple of basically, you know, courses where I okay. didn't have to do anything, just kind of sitting around. And then, um, and then I, I went to work basically soon after that, I went to work in 2005 for the agency the end of 2005 oh really yeah. so you didn't do another deployment with uh sf so it. so are you still are you getting more into coffee at this point or are you yeah, like yeah. a steady state of just you have a, a routine no i i went to kirkuk so where it really escalated was i, I was in kirkuk and uh, with the agency with now the agency okay. so i'm not I'm how did that agency. work before you get there how did it work from how did you decide i did the that, invasion with ground branch so everybody oh, knows did. yeah so the oda was attached to uh ground branch and um, that was years ago, so I don't have it. So when did you start? When did you get flip on flip over? Agency? Yeah, uh, they they asked me to interview um, during like literally then. So uh, I was I was oh there. with them. You were yeah. physically with. I was with the agency. You were not. I was at with the agency, and were then they the were agency. asking. Got it. Yeah, they were asking if I wanted to go back and interview. So I came back. I Got interviewed. It. Um, it took a long time. So essentially, you know, you get out process, and then. Uh, you get picked up, kind of. Uh, went to work for contracting element initially. I actually went to work for for a guy that was the former deputy director of the agency mm -hmm. first. His name was John McGaffin, legendary agency guy. Like he was the guy in in uh, Charlie Wilson's War uh, that told Gus Avocados, if you remember the book, mm -hmm. I'm sure you do. He was like, "Well, come Great to my book. office." We're killing Russians. So he was, uh, John McGaffin was the guy that was okay. essentially running the entire uh, counter Russian Afghan initiative. He was the guy. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's a legendary, legendary spy. So he, uh, he retired out of the agency as a deputy director. Uh, I, I went to work interimly for him, um, doing some stuff out of the UK and uh, awesome phenomenal person yeah i can't say enough about john and everything that he did for me so like incredible guy awesome. um like in in uh, to be fair like you know he was probably one of the most influential agency guys at, at one in my life and i think probably in many others mm -hmm. uh you know he was the first station chief that robert bear actually had which i'm sure you're familiar with mm -hmm. with bob bear um, he, he had a really good relationship and he had, was really good friends with the former King Hussein, which was Jordan. He'd been shot in like Syria. Like when, when we're talking about spooks, like this guy was like blocking and tackling like one of probably the most legendary case officers in, yeah. in, in the, in the building. Okay. Um, you know, hard drinker. Like I, I love the fact like these guys were like it was is that the Alan Dulles type of template, mm. which was, you know, he was like, I want college professors that aren't afraid to get in a bar fight, right? It's like the Shackleton job description. PhDs who can win a bar fight. Yeah, exactly. Right. So he was that guy. Hyper intelligent, like, you know, politically not correct at all, mm. could could drink a gallon of liquor. And still have his shit together, mm -hmm. you know, um, which, as we know, like, obviously, you know, with our peer group and former special operations and case officers, like a lot of them struggle with alcohol abuse. So it's actually not not a thing that we should, you know, uh, sensationalize. But there yeah. is something that's like as there's a Hooten young Bob <laughs> right there, better known yeah. and operated uh, former Delta yeah. guy, Norm Hooten right there with the uh, yeah, Hawks Hoot, on that's there. That's right. Yeah. Like, which is like. I, by the way, I think that it's 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 more than comfortable to to say that it's it's something we can all participate in. It's just like man, now you look back on it, I'm like a lot of alcoholism in the in the tribe, right? Yeah. Um, but he was just an amazing, and I I don't know, I haven't talked to him for a couple of years. I don't know if he's still around or not, so I'll have to reach out to him. But a pretty amazing character. Yeah. Like, How did you get link up with him? Through the uh, like through the agency guys, like, and you just had a connection. Yeah. Yeah, because after the invasion of Iraq, I met a bunch of those guys and then kind of got connected in with yeah. other people. And then pretty soon those guys connect in with other guys. And then 
Yeah. You know, and then you're a known entity, like it or not. So whether or not they like you or don't like you, it'll kind of establish your, yeah. your, uh, your path over there. Did you, uh, uh, were you, I guess, impressed with the training that you got when you stepped on board over there or did you? Not really. Like, you know, I think that the, the, the agency has a lot of really good, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was very, um, I was exposed to a very small element of it. Um, you know, I did, I did a kind of a cross reference of things, you know, I did some protection. I, when I first went over there and then I did more management and then I moved into more like some covert action and then came back into training. So I kind of did a whole litany of different things, which I enjoyed. It was an interesting nine years. Um, you know, I think a lot of soft guys that go over there, they, um, they're underwhelmed. Or they're mm. they're under impressed with the uh, what I would say is a the the paramilitary organization has a lack of uh, the type of military infrastructure that the special operations community has, mm. and I don't think I'm out of place by saying like you know guys come out of like force or the teams or SF or you know CAG or one of those units and then go over there and they're it's a little bit um, less organized. There's less support. Yeah. Um, That's what I liked about it, actually, yeah. is because yeah. uh, I came from uh, all that. And yeah. by the time, you know, a few year, years into this war, PowerPoints are expanding. They yeah, are getting yeah. very long. These approval process is something that is, a, uh, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. Um, and you're putting together the, all the, your, most of the initial sale. You're working the, the, the human level Intel stuff. And then you're corroborating that with whatever technical type of uh, assets you have available and putting the target packages together. And then you're sending them up the chain and it's going up and it's going up. And depending on that target, it can go very high yeah, yep. and then it's coming back down. And people at all these different levels are looking at your PowerPoint presentation, which I think got to be like, I don't know, a hundred slots. Like it was a lot. It was, it was a they lot. were a lot. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. Were, they were big. So I can't went right from that and then got sucked over to the agency side and there was like none, none of that. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I'm in heaven. <laughs> like, I love this. This is so <laughs> fantastic. You mean you just walk over there and you like ask the, you know, chief of base, chief of state, whatever. Yeah. Like, like you talk to them and, and mm -hmm. say, Hey, we're going after tonight and you have asset X, Y, or Z, whatever you need. And then you go out and do it. Like, that's it. And then for me, all I have to do is is uh, get in touch with all the different battle space owners and make sure they have a QRF ready to go at a certain level of uh, you know readiness. Uh, and I'll be talking to them as we get there, tactical comms. And uh, oh, this is amazing! Like it was just so different. But for me, I liked that. Yeah, I really did. This is Jack Carr, and I want to talk to you about Schnee's boots. If you followed me for a while, you know what a big fan I am. This pair right here is the same pair that I've been wearing for over a decade now, and these are the ones that I wear when I want to come out heavier than I went in on a backcountry hunt. So I uh, love these things. They are awesome absolutely awesome. And I have a bunch of different kinds of boots. They're pack boots. Um, and to go check them out at schnees.com, S-C-H-N-E-E-S.com. Schnee's Mountain Boots are handmade in their Italian factory located in the foothills of the Italian Alps. Each boot is made from the absolute highest quality materials available, from the fine leathers to heavy-duty hardware and Vibram outsoles. They only sell direct to you without the middleman markup. This means they can put higher quality materials and craftsmanship in every boot. So you get more boot for your money. They are also all backed by Schnee's industry leading customer service and support. When you call them, you'll talk to someone right there in Montana that actually wears the boots. So be sure and give them a call. They have a lot of options out there. Find the right boot for you. Definitely check them out. If you head over to schnees.com, S-C-H-N-E-E-S.com, you can score up to 30% off your new pair of mountain boots. You heard that right. You can save 30% off any pair of regularly priced Schnee's mountain boots. Use promo code JACK23, J-A-C-K-2-3. That's schnees.com, S-C-H-N-E-E-S.com. JACK23 is the promo code. Enjoy those boots. Yeah, I think there are times like my I, I did a couple of years on a on a uh, on a good on a project where I had a lot of unilateral discretion as to what I did, and that was good. Mm. Like I had a you know essentially a, a twenty three million dollar budget, and I was about the only person that could figure out what I'm, what I was doing every day uh, for 
for two years. Oh. Um, and that was, a, that was really interesting. And it was actually probably in, in the professional evolution perspective, it probably had the most impact on my life because I realized that I, I found a lot of professional develop or professional fulfillment out of just being my own boss. Mm-hmm. And then you go into other layers of it and it has kind of uh, standard government bureau- bureaucratic politics. Mm. It, whereas like some of the things in special operations were less bureaucratic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I should say they, they were just as bureaucratic. They were less political, mm. less political. It was more mission focused. This is what yeah. we're doing. This is how we're going to accomplish it. Uh, when you're in an organization that lives in DC, it's real in it, and you know it's run by a political appointee. There is no way that organization is not politically affected. There's no way, and uh, that's the unfortunate reality of our just our in- intelligence that we we you know from from the nation defense perspective. Um, I think the military has a very profound mission focus. I think there's a ton of really incredible people working within the agency and, and obviously the Intel community, uh, but it does get infected with Democrat or Republican, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be around party. It should should be an anti-partisan organization that is only driven based on mission, like mission success or failure. Yeah. And that's the one thing I would say it was like a negative perspective. So like, you saw that? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, well, and, and just when you see it, because you, you see it from, um, you know, a blue green or, or yellow, depending on the color of your badge, you see it from the, um, uh, what, what I would say is you know, professional advancement. Mm. You see the way that people advance through the organization and then how, um, how people are being rewarded for what, you know, so, you know, I've, I've, I've directly equated it to the missions versus the me's, you know, in any organization, especially when it comes to the, the military or government organization, you have people that are about the mission and they're essentially self-sacrificing and they're going to do anything for mission success. That includes their professional development. And a lot of those people, they don't, and I'm not referring to myself, I'm referring to other people that I'd say, were really about the mission, you would see them being passed over for mm. promotion because the the guys and gals that were more focused on their me, you know, how do I get promoted? It becomes more sociopathic and Machiavellian in their professional development. Yeah. They're willing to do whatever it takes uh, to get the promotion, um, to get whatever ego justification, whatever that might be. Uh, I think the the military does are especially the special operations community, I think they do a better job of weeding out the me's mm. um, and getting to the mission. I think that's actually le- leads to the direct success of a lot of these special operations units that are essentially folklore at this point mm. is because they're so mission focused and they've allowed themselves to weed the me's out yeah. to the point where it's just about the mission. Yeah. Um, they'll do anything, Right. Like that, that's what makes people and organizations legendary. Yeah. And that's like truly. Like, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I haven't heard it put that way before, but uh, totally, I can see it, totally see that, that you have that perspective. Um, yeah, I think I was shielded from a lot of that because my time there was so limited. Right. Um, so I didn't see the the political side of it. It was just the, the mission from that smaller group. And it was awesome. And now things have come back kind of full circle. Those people that were, were there then that we were on the, just doing those missions with are now uh, getting out yeah. and they're moving on and then uh, getting in touch and, right. uh, you know, through so-and-so or whatever. And so it's really cool to, uh, to reconnect with those guys because it was such an intense time in mm-hmm. Iraq uh, and such an impactful time on me uh, personally and professionally. Professionally, and I weave a lot of the things that happen there into the novels, right. a lot of the feelings and emotions behind them, um, more so than exactly what happened. But uh, but it's cool to, to reconnect after uh, after all these years, and uh, yeah, so that's that's another that's a cool sp- part about all of this. It's awesome. I got, yeah. I was talking to uh, Steve Cashin. He runs uh, Third Option, Third Option mm. Foundation yeah. now. Um, we met originally in Kabul back in the day. He's a retired. Um, uh, unit sergeant major that came over like just incredible guy. I talked to him on the phone the other day for like an hour. 
about how, you know, how could we help out with third option? Um, you know, how can we get more involved with the community? Yeah. You know, especially helping guys as they transition and then they're, they're running into more, yeah. you know, we're getting older, right? Our peer group of guys are just getting older, running in different health issues that I think, um, from nonprofits, like they can really plug in and be direct, you know, direct yeah. benefit. Uh, Clint trial, like he was yeah. obviously blown up a few years ago. He's a really close friend of mine. He's awesome. Works so here at awesome. PRCC. He, he, he's really tied in and instrumental in that community. Um, so we're, we're, we're constantly trying to just tie back in. How do we help? Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, I have, I have a profound love for most of those guys. Cause I know, especially within the paramilitary organization of, of that place that you have way more missions than you have me's yeah. way more missions. Yeah. Yep. It was a, yeah, a fun, fun memories, you know, it was pretty intense, but, uh, I absolutely loved it. Um, and at what point do you start thinking, ah, oh, it's time to move on and leave government service behind? And what made you uh, want to leave it behind? How long were you thinking about leaving before you actually left? Years. Years. Yeah. You know, the last couple of years, I, I was frustrated. I think that, you know, the agency was frustrated with me. Same, same. Like, I was burnt out. I'd done 43 rotations or something like that in nine years. Um, I was burnt. Like, I was just burnt. I was, I was constantly gone. I was gone, you know. 300 days a year. I uh, didn't really have, I didn't really have a life. I wanted to start a family. Um, and, you know, it was kind of a mutually agreed upon terms for me to leave because I was going to get fired either way. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds mutual to me. Yeah. And so, you know, I quit before, I, you know, most of the time I just tell people I got fired because it's easier. And, um, but it's, you know, I, I quit before that day could happen. Mm. Um, and it was actually, it was, why was there something that happened that they were like, Oh, this guy's needs to move on or something that you saw, you, you saw as like, Oh yeah. Lots. I'm on yeah. As soon as I can or lots. Like there were just lots of different things where, you know, when you're, I, I was running a selection program over there for a while and, uh, wasn't making a lot of friends, mm. um, because I was also vetting guys for their future mm. employment for the organization as well. So it was the guys that have been working there also had to come through my course mm. to keep their jobs, which, you know, when you're telling people they're not qualified to be in the position they're at, mm. doesn't lend itself well. Um, I had managed to get in a, 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 a physical uh, altercation on one of my, on one of my trips with a couple, with a couple other guys. And, um, they were using that trip. So I got, we got basically jumped in, in, uh, in Israel. That was several, like, uh, God, it was 13 years ago, I guess. And, um, we got in this fight with a bunch of Russians out there, right? Downtown in Jerusalem. What? Yeah. And, uh, I've actually never told this story. So we got in this fight. Like at a bar? Uh, no, we were coming home from the bars like two o'clock in the morning. We we're crossing the road and a car came screaming down this alley and almost hit one of the guys. And uh, um, they piled out. And uh, we fucking went to throwing blows right there in the downtown Israel. Or Israel. Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem. And uh, the the guys that were out there, the um, guys that was in, he was in charge of uh, our little group, he had an ax to grind with a couple of the fellows out there and, uh, I wouldn't roll. So when I say that, I like, I wouldn't turn my, my guys in whether or not they were, uh, started it or didn't start it. It was, I wasn't going to hold the party line in the context of, uh, you know, we, we got in a fight and that how'd, you guys, how'd you guys do? We, we did. Okay. I mean, one of the guys had a portion of his ear ripped off and he had his ocular sockets broken uh, we got sprayed with pepper spray. I mean, it, was a, it was a legit fight. Like and, uh, it seems kind of random uh, that a group of Russians has pepper spray in the two a.m. downtown Jerusalem. Just happens to run into <laughs> a group of agency yeah, guys crossing uh, the street. It's it, sounding suspect and, to me. Yeah, it is. And from there on, I had a staff guy uh, that really he and I we we were at odds the rest of the time that I was there. Yeah. 
And, uh, but did you think it was, hey, this is just random? This is just random? No, he was he was using that as a catalyst to get... No, I mean the Russians out. that happened. Yeah, to... it was. It was fairly random. I mean, we were in a Russian bar. We we were drinking. We probably shouldn't have been drinking. All this stuff. A Russian like, bar. So not like a Russian spa? A Russian bar. bar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was always a good fun. I mean, it was always good fun. A great selection of like, vodka. You knew that you were going to... There, there are a couple things that were going to happen. If you went to the Russian bar, hmm. one, you're going to get really drunk. Two, you're probably going to get in a fight. So it wasn't random. I see. It's just really bad decisions by, you know, 20 something. They call 30 it something. snowballing. Yeah. And for me, it was more around like, it was very infrequent for me to do things like this to mm. begin with. But uh, there's one of my guys there that I, I still have a ton of respect for and love him to this day. Uh, he was probably responsible for the whole thing, but yeah. there's no way I was gonna. There's no way I was gonna say that, and uh, and then uh, it's, a know, possibility. It's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. I don't know for sure. And I don't know for sure, and uh, that just you know what for me, it was a point of reference that uh, you know you don't you, you go to bat for your dudes because at the end of the day, these are the guys that are also going to save your life. Yeah. These are the guys that are also going to have to step up and uh you know watch your six when when you're down range mm-hmm. in a gunfight and if you're not willing to do that in the office they're not going to do that when you're in a gunfight so at the end of the day did it cost me yeah it sure did uh but i was ready to leave either way i was ready to go did you know what you're gonna do no no i was like ah i'll figure it out like i i truly had no no real plan um but I figured, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's like if you go to law school or, you know, go back and do something else, you know, there's a million different things you can do. Mm-hmm. Like it's just a matter of like, you know, do you have the curiosity? Do you have the drive? Uh, the business, from a business perspective, I, I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to essentially be my, my, my boss. Mm-hmm. Um, and that gave me a sense of freedom where... You know, it's kind of teach a man to fish, right? They'll eat for the rest of their life. It's the same thing where it's like, if you understand business and you understand how to make, you know, make money, Mm -hmm. you can feed yourself or your family forever. And, you know, the business practices and principles that you'll learn, uh, you won't need, you know, a, uh, you won't, you won't need to go and find another job. More importantly for me, when I left, uh, what I said was, I will never allow another man to be responsible for my professional future. So I will never be beholden to another person that can put my professional jeopardy or my professional life at jeopardy. Mm. Uh, I will never put myself into a position like that ever again. Uh, so it was a it was a really profound experience for me yeah. because uh, when you when you when you do things that what you feel are the the, the hard right or the easy wrong, and you do that a lot you put your professional development at risk and definitely in, in government organizations. Uh, you're not making friends and being a politician. Like for me, it was more about the mission. And when you do that, you're also going to be at odds with, with a lot of people. Um, when you call bullshit on the me's, <laughs> mm. try to really focus on the mission, you, you, you're going to butt heads. Yeah. And, um, when you butt heads, you, you jeopardize your future professional development. You do like you're, you're going to, especially in different places like the government. Um, so at that point it was, can't do that anymore. Off you go. Yeah. Did you go back to Idaho? What did you do? What, what was the first, came uh, I came, came here right here to, Utah. uh, to Utah. Yeah. And, uh, what was the first twist, business venture? Twist rate. So I had, uh, been working on a, 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 Covert communication antenna huh. uh, for the last couple of years on my side project. No way. Uh, for with a company out of here, and uh, I met some guys out out of Utah that had this. It was it was basically a, an antenna that you could use in, in a rattle can. You could like rattle it up, spray it on a wall, hook an EKG lead onto it, and do covert comps. And I met those guys. They were. LPI, like, LPD, low probability yeah, interception, yeah, exactly, low probability yeah. detection. Yeah, exactly. Look at that yeah, one I pulled yeah, out look right at there. You. Yeah, yeah, so you know, still there. I, I met him, and still I was like, it. you know what? Uh, 
uh, I'll go try this out. And um, I pitched them on this idea around an idea that there was a crowdfunding site for um, uh, defense-related technology, so firearms and defense-related technologies, because Kickstarter at the time wouldn't allow you to do that. Mm. So in being downrange, as much as I had, we would see this happen multiple times. These companies would come in and they would take an idea from an operator. They would suck that idea up (laughs) and then they would patent it and then they would monetize it and they would sell it back to the government. I was like, that's bullshit. Yeah, that happened once or twice. Yeah, it happened the entire GWAT, right? So for me, I said, well, why, why are these companies... You know, reaping the direct benefit of operators' intellectual property. So we should start something that helps them out. Yeah. Um, what was it called? Twist rate. Twist rate. What Does happened that, to it? Didn't go anywhere. Didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Are you working yeah. on other projects at the same time? Are you, you're doing that? Yeah, I was you... doing uh, this other thing called Ready Man. Uh, Ready Man and Twist Rate. Basically Does that still at the exist? Same time. I forget. Yeah, still kicking around. Okay. And uh, I'd started it with a former teammate of mine. Uh, we were doing that together, and then uh, basically, I was roasting coffee in kind of the side, just as as a hobby. And I met Matt and Jared, and I was like, "Why don't I roast coffee with, for Article 15? Because they'd started that already. Yeah, they're making yeah. their videos. Yeah, they're making their t-shirts. Videos. Yeah, t-shirts and videos. Mm. And uh, so I did uh, freedom roasters coffee for article 15 i okay. roasted that for those guys and uh a few months later i said man i really just want to roast coffee like did truly. you say that well obviously you love it yeah that's apparent but we did it did you also see hey we're selling coffee yeah i mean we sold 500 bags like like that like just 500 bags sold out in like a matter of like a week or something like that and i just kind of did the numbers and i was like well shit if i can sell 500 bags a week you know, that's a couple thousand pounds a month. I could probably pay my mortgage doing this. Yeah. And it's something I like to do. So the original concept was just, well, do a range, you know, like a like a bougie, cool mm-hmm. range coffee shop concept. Mm-hmm. That's where, you know, uh, I, I Black Rifle came from on the back tailgate of a government truck is what I always, you know, refer to because I was out there roasting coffee on the back tailgate of a, of a, government suburban on a one pound coffee roaster and i was stamping a um, a brown bag with black rifle coffee and it was something before there was even a name black rifle coffee Mm -hmm. it was something i was doing for my friends Mm. before there was an actual like no shit official llc and um so when 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 i did it for article 15 i was like wait a minute i can actually do this yeah and so light bulb goes off. Light bulb goes off. And then I can also do like a range concept because I was like, man, I, wouldn't it be cool, man? We could sell like, you know, high-end ARs and like race guns and like, oh. you know, do some really cool, you know, content around this stuff. Okay. And then have a coffee roaster where we're roasting coffee. And uh, what we did was we ended up ramping it up in the in the context of we were selling a lot of coffee and I never oh. had the opportunity to like go down and build a no shit facility until um, I put a coffee shop in ready gunner with Neil. Oh wow. And that was four years later. I guess and that I did was not realize first, that that was the first coffee shop. That was the first no shit. Wow. Coffee shop in a range. No was kidding. a ready gunner. Yep. That was it. And now we have, I don't know, several coffee shops and ranges now, like at least. Okay. Uh, yeah. They're like, coffee service and ranges and so we i think we sell coffee in 2000 ranges or something like that man that is awesome (laughs) yeah and now and there's brick and mortar which started like 30 three years ago four years ago yeah uh three years ago i think i have 30 i have 30 shops now give or take and then uh grocery we we do a ton of grocery like we do you know we're the i think the second most selling coffee in the largest grocery store in America, which is, that is awesome. Yeah. Like right there. And there it is. Terminalist, Terminalist. coffee right there with there Amazon Prime. What? No, it's not Man. wild. 
That's crazy. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Like I was, Amazon. I was holding my breath a little bit on uh, on Every, that one. Everybody was. Like, everybody was. Everybody was like, ah, are you sure? Like, wait a minute. Is Amazon really going to do this? And they I did don't it. know if they really looked into it. They I, just did it. I, it was awesome. It's, I, yeah. I mean, we've got uh, Chris wearing this shirt right I know. here. In the show, yeah, uh, Black Raffle Coffee, of course, in the in the books, and it's uh, it's just such a you know such a connection to the veteran community, and uh, so maybe they did look into it and they realized you know yeah. the the connection to, to veterans and first responders and everything that you've done for veterans and first responders and police officers and firefighters and intelligence community and uh, and where that passion comes from. So maybe that was a yeah I don't know well I don't it's know, but it worked it worked it's interesting because like I don't I don't tout some of this stuff. You know, and I probably should, you know, Patagonia always talks about their 1% of profit, right? And profit is, eh, mm. it's profit. Profit's like, you know, obviously you strip out all your expenses and you define what's profit. And, you know, you can make that, you can shrink or grow that number depending on what you're trying to say. Mm. Um, you know, we did 1% of gross revenue last year. So we, we donated over three and a half million dollars back to 501 uh, which is 1% of gross revenue. So when you're talking about like profitability uh, and those numbers really do matter, you know, most, I donated more money back to nonprofits than most uh, coffee companies in America with 90% of their top line revenue. Yeah. So like for us, it's definitely a source of pride, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, I get to go out and write really big checks to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, the Green Beret Foundation or, you know, even conservation, like yeah. we write checks to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, nice. um, Wild Sheep Foundation, some of these other places that, to be fair, like, like I'm pretty passionate about not only the veteran community, but also conservation. Because yeah. that's what people, people always ask me, they're like, well, wh why do you do those two things? I'm like, because they're the two things I really love. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I think everybody... You know, for me, I, I love being able to go out into the wildlife or out into the wilds and, and see wildlife with my yeah. kids. Um, you know, I love being able to take, you know, be able to take some of that wildlife out and then put it on the table, feed my family with it. And I love trying to give back to the community. It's it's a, a huge source of pride. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's probably from the fulfillment perspective, it, it is the most fulfilling part yeah. of the job, which is I get to hire people and I get to get back. Yeah, I saw Jocko yesterday actually talking about one percent of uh, uh, companies that sell in, let's say, REIs. And yeah, whatever else, right. And talking about how well, okay, well, you're doing that, but you're making this thing in China or Thailand or whatever else, where these conditions for the not just the worker, obviously that's not great, uh, but also the pollution coming from these places over there, and you're doing it to make this profit, and you're giving, so you're causing this much. And you're giving back this much, but you're tout, you're using this as a marketing thing to say, oh, we're giving back 1% here, but you just created all this because you shipped all that overseas and been doing that for a long time. So that was interesting to hear him just call it out uh, the other day, yesterday. Well, it is. And it's, and it's really interesting that people can, you know, export all their labor and services outside of the country. Cause I, I mean, I, I hear it and I'm actually you know, I'll get fired up now because when we talk about the ESG, which is, uh, you know, when we think about environmental, social, and governments, that's, it's like a huge, uh, in, in investment, um, uh, in the investment and in banking community, specifically around finance, the finance industry, they look into this BlackRock really started it. Uh, which by the way, when you think about, you know, those three words, of course, like, yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, we need, we need to be concerned about the environment. And when we think about, like all the things that we, we want to do from, you know, equalizing uh, the, the fair playing field in business. And I'm more from, from my perspective, looking at it, not only from environmental impact, but I'm also looking at it from a national security perspective, yeah. which is if we can create jobs in America and, and keep them here and then create more opportunities for Americans to make a livable and above livable wage, and at the same time, we're maintaining, you know, clean air and we're being environmentally responsible. You know, we're creating jobs for, 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 for veterans, which is typically an, an underemployed mm. portion of our, of our country. It's an underemployed. When I first started this, you know, veteran hiring initiative, 
the veterans in America, specifically a GWAT veteran, was about 3.5% above the national average in, in unemployment. Mm. So we're, we're, it's called an underemployment. It's not unemployed. It's underemployment. Okay. And, uh, w- you know, we, we threw that out as far as, like, we're going to hire 10,000 veterans, which is still a thing that we, we continue to, to hire against every, every day. Um, and now I'm not saying we've done that, but I'm saying that we've been able to make from a business perspective, we've been able to make a national dent mm. uh, from the narrative. And now we're, we as a group, as a subset, we sit below the national average for under for unemployed. And so when we think about the social, when we look at like social impact, mm. what, what I'm doing is I'm making a difference in my community. My community is a peer group of veterans that have been through, you know, two decades of war. And then I'm also, when I, from my perspective, I think there's, there is a, a, a moral and ethical obligation for corporations in the United States to, to give back to national security, create jobs. Mm-hmm. So if we're creating jobs, not only in, in our country, but we're also creating jobs in this hemisphere, yeah. we're stabilizing the hemisphere. So when I go to Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, or anywhere else, you know, in this hemisphere, and I'm talking about... Uh, sustainable farming practices and sustainable economic impact in creating jobs in, in Guatemala, mm-hmm. that means something to me. You know why? Because if I'm creating economic opportunity outside of our country, there's going to be less of a, what I would say is a national impact from people that are crossing the border illegally. Yeah. And these are the topics that I think companies and CEOs need to be talking about more so than you know, placating a fractional percentage of, of people in the United States based on the time of month or whatever the fuck they want to talk about, which is somewhat ridiculous. If we don't have a country because, you know, China's going to hand us our lunch economically or strategically, that's an issue for me because we don't, we don't get to uh, propagate our American ide- ideals. And, uh, you know, Russia, you know, as we're looking at, you know, economic... Sovereignty and economic hegemony is is truly a thing. I've used that twice now in this conversation, but like I do, I do believe that that the United States should lead the world economically. I don't believe in a world where we need to play fair. Nor do I believe in this, you, you know, socialist objective where we have to play fair with China. I don't fucking believe that. I think that's a that is some like socialist bullshit that you know they're ultimately out polluting at at a thousand times what we are they're exploiting people they're using you know natural resources uh that ultimately we could be using in our country they're going out into places in africa they're they're not only having a lasting environmental impact but they're also using exploitive you know uh, mineral harvesting practices they're using child labor they're using slave labor they're like the laundry list of things oh, that we have to do. To say nothing of undermining yeah. our national security through uh, through subversion of youth, perhaps right. TikTok, and fentanyl coming across right. the border that precursors are coming from China. Um, and yeah, to say nothing of that side of it. Right. So it's, it's for me, this, this entire narrative around ESG and ESG investing, when there's not a security, no. so environmental, social, and governance, and there's not a system, there's not a security S yeah. like let's work on putting a security S from the investment perspective, because we have to have sovereignty and it, it, it does bother me yeah. when we think about like maintaining economic security and then like not only like strategic and tactical superiority from like a military perspective, we have to do this from an investment perspective in the country. We have to invest in companies that actually keep dollars here. Yeah. So I 100% like, I agree with Chaco. Um, I, I think, I, and I, I, I feel it uh, more from the investment and financial industry because yeah. they're always asking me about, um, you know, you know, the, the ESGs. And I'm like, my, what I'm doing is I'm making an impact in our community, mm. giving back to the things that matter to the veteran community. I'm giving back to the things that, that I'm hiring and giving back to the, envi- the veteran community. I'm also keeping jobs in our hemisphere. Could I increase margin 
uh, by taking some of our business to you know, more price advantageous places. Yeah, but I'm just not willing to do that because I'm not going to capitulate on the things that I think they're going to make our country truly great. Yeah. Not going to. Last year, Fox premiered the hit reality show, Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. They took celebrities like world-class athletes, pop stars, actors, and put them through a grueling version of real Special Forces training in the blistering desert heat. And now, hell has frozen over. Special Forces is back, dropping 14 new celeb recruits into the frigid, snow-capped mountains of New Zealand. People like NFL star Des Bryant, model actress Black China, Olympic champion Bodie Miller, and television personality Jack Osborne have all left their extravagant lifestyles behind to take on the biggest challenge of their lives. An elite team of ex-Special Forces soldiers will challenge these celebs' minds and bodies. They will receive no special treatment and will be handled just like any new recruit. The goal is to endure 10 days of real danger and real consequences. They'll take on tasks like crossing a ravine on a 4,700-foot mountain peak and escaping from a helicopter submerged in icy waters. There's no prize, no winner, only survival. Can they make it to the end without giving up or being medically disqualified? Don't miss Special Forces, world's toughest test. All new Mondays on Fox. Man, did you, uh, I mean, now there's a lot more. I would guess, uh, responsibilities and uh, mm-hmm. drains on time, not drains on time, but there's a lot more you have on your plate, I would guess. But at what point did you realize that, oh, this is really going somewhere uh, bigger than you had envisioned? Oh, um, probably year three. Okay. Um, so it took a little while. You're getting uh, out there. You're seeing numbers. You're seeing growth. Yeah. I, well, I mean, our first year... We did 1.3 million out of my garage. Dang. Um, I didn't take, I didn't take a salary. Uh, I, and I, when I didn't take a salary and I was still able to give back $10,000 to a veteran nonprofit. Um, I didn't take a salary till my first, till my third year. Mm. And I sold everything that I owned in order to make that happen because it was reinvesting in the company, mm-hmm. which is an important differentiation because I'm a capitalist. I'm not, I'm not a, um, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, what, what, what they're trying to create is wealth. So they're trying to create individual wealth, which, by the way, is fine. Capitalists, by the definition, is you invest in infrastructure for growth, not based on the fact that you want to profit individually, which would be more of a profiteer perspective. Mm-hmm. I'm a capitalist. Is I like building and investing in infrastructure. Mm-hmm. That's my main passion. Like I want to grow something big. Yeah. But it's not because I'm individually focused on material wealth. I, by the way, I have nothing against material wealth. I just, like, I've got two beautiful kids and a wonderful wife. Like, I've got, my, my needs are met, and they're already kind of ex- exceeded a standard as far as, you know, emotional fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Now it's about, like, how do we invest in the infrastructure? How do we grow the company? How do we create more opportunities? How do we invest more from, you know, the, we're a benefits corp. So how do we invest back into the corporation or yeah. in, into the things that matter? Uh, but after about year three, I realized, oh, I can pay myself. So I can pay myself a compensation. Um, after I think year five, uh, I realized like, this is what I'll do. Mm. This is it. Mm. This is my, 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 fir- my kind of my first and last business. Yeah. Um, I, I won't need to have any anything else. Yeah. Not a you know, knock on wood, right? It's um I truly love doing the business. Like I love um building. Like yeah. that that's that's like the best thing for me. Like yeah. it, it is my it is my thing. I like building. Yeah. Like I you know, there's there's a lot of people that go out and they pontificate about business and they want to talk about le- leadership or it sounds like I'm I'm saying that against anti leadership. I'm not, it's just I like to just do. And for me, it's, it's leading by example is a big thing. Yeah. Uh, the reason I took the company public was to show an entire generation of GWAT vets that you could start something in your garage and you could be traded on the New York Stock Exchange nine years later. Uh, I took that charter very serious. I, mm-hmm. I personally didn't, 
like make any money contrary to the, the popular belief in that transaction. Um, you know, it's really difficult as a public company CEO to, it's not, I, I can't really sell stock unless I'm announcing it, you know, almost a year in advance and uh, filing a plan. So for, for me personally, this is about showing the, the entire community this could happen then too. You know, this was, this is, this is being part of the greatest you know, country in the world from my perspective. And then also, you know, the New York Stock Exchange is, 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 is the pinnacle example of what it means to be a capitalist in America to take your company to the New York Stock Exchange across the street from where George Washington was sworn into office is being part of America. It's being yeah. part of America's story. I honestly can't think of a, uh, a more profound way to be part of America's story than to serve America in, you know, in, in the service of, of her, you know, in the, in, the, in the beauty of this country, and then turn around and then participate in the capitalist structure that we have and try to, to not only do it yourself, but also lead a gr group of other people to transition out of government service into being capitalists, into being... The, the catalyst to their community and to go out and start a company that, where they can hire other veterans, where they can invest back into the veteran community. To me, this is a force multiplying effect. So once a Green Beret, always a Green Beret, right? I, I'm a force multiplier. I'm a builder. Mm -hmm. I'm a capitalist. That's what I truly love to do. Uh, I don't really, like, you know, it's easy for me to say it's, it's not about the dollars, nor do I need another one. It's more yeah. about the things that you can build. Well, it was awesome to see you guys out there and uh, ringing that bell, those photos, the look on everyone's face. And it was just awesome to see cool. that, to see you guys grow. Becoming aware of you guys, I forget exactly when, but it was you know fairly early on. Probably as I was getting out, I think. Maybe a, yeah, because right, right I around think Tom, and Tom hooked us up. So right? Tom, I've yeah. known Tom for, for yeah. years and years. Uh, Tom Davin, awesome. Yeah. I'd go up to 5'11", and we'd go. He had, he had a really cool, I don't know if you ever went to 5'11", when he was there, but he had this really, uh, from oh, yeah. Italy, I think, that expressed whatever coffee yeah. thing that he had built yeah. in. And so it was part of the deal. And I'd go up there, get a coffee with him. We go get lunch together. And he always made time for me. He's yeah. running that company. I'm still in the military. I zip up, you know, depending on traffic, it's, you know, an hour, hour and a half, whatever. And, uh, and we just get to hang out for a little bit, but he always made time for me. It was never mm -hmm. like, I'm too busy right now. And that, that really stuck with me yeah. from him. Yeah. It's awesome. Awesome guy. But, uh, so I forget exactly where I first heard of you, but then, then of course, when I'm out, then I'm watching because now I'm building something. And I realized that as an author, you're not just an author today. Uh, because now with the things that have, that weren't available in 1985, 95, right. Well, there's these other platforms that are available where you can be a business and you can make people aware of your product where back in 1985, the publisher was the only right. one that could really do that. Um, at a level that would that would sell books. Um, not so today, cause I saw you guys do it. And so I was watching you in a completely different industry, but I'm watching these guys and I'm watching these videos and I'm watching this company grow and, uh, veterans of course, and they're adapting to a changing environment just like we would yeah. on the battlefield. So I looked at publishing and, uh, I think that was really, that was really important to be able to see you guys do that and to realize, Oh, I can look at publishing, not just as this model that I grew up with where I see a author, a book and oh, it's published by this and there it is in the New York. And okay. Well, I saw these guys utilizing YouTube. I saw Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, uh, and all these other things, all these supporting, yeah. uh, efforts that, uh, that supported the main effort of this coffee company. Um, and so it was really, so it was really cool. That was really uh, important. I think for me to see that, uh, as I stepped out of uniform and into the private sector and into something that I was passionate about, which is, is writing. So, so I just took that model, looked at it and I don't think many others had or have looked at it that way. And it's just an opportunity and you gotta, you can build these things yourself. You don't have to be reliant no. on anyone these days, um, or hope for that, uh, that someone's going to book you an interview somewhere. Uh, cause if you're hoping for that and you're not, don't have a last name like King Patterson, uh, Grisham, right, um, right. You know, it's like kind of like in publishing uh, well, in the movie Avengers for a long time, made the money for all the other movies that yeah, didn't yeah. make any money. Right. Thing. Same thing in publishing those yeah. names that, uh, that have been on the, on the New York times list for decades. Uh, they're making money for a lot of the books that don't make that money back. Right. So where's that company then going to, going to allocate assets just like in the talk. 
If you're on the, the battlefield, you have to add, allocate assets. You have a certain number of them back there in that tactical yeah. operations center. Same thing at a publishing company. They have certain number of assets available to help people and their authors, but they need to double down on the ones that are actually <laughs> going to keep them in business yep. and keep those lights on. So as soon as you realize that, I think, uh, and you guys helped me realize that. So thank you for, for that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's awesome. Like I love hearing that because I, I, that's the, the, the goal, right? It's, mm. it's not about, it's not about me, right? It's not, it's about the, you know, it's about, you know, guys like you that have made the transition that are going out. And if you can learn from, you know, our mistakes, or if you can learn from what we've, you know, our successes mm. and failures, which is essentially just a after action report. Yeah. And, you know, I hear it almost every week, every day, depending on where I am, like whether I was in, I was in uh, big sky, Montana, for the total archery challenge. I had a guy stop me in the airport. I was like, dude, I, I, I now have a, an awesome job. Like I saw you guys doing this. Like nice. you guys inspired me to get, get out, uh, of the fire service because I, he's like, I was miserable. And mm -hmm. I was listening to your podcast. I was like, I'm fucking miserable. I'm going to change my life. He's mm -hmm. like, I'm now I'm like, I have, I have, I have a better life mm -hmm. because of what you guys showed me you could do. That's cool. I took a bunch of guys out to uh, dinner the other night. I just met him in the airport. Our, our, uh, my, uh, my flight was canceled coming out of Springfield, Missouri. And there were a couple guys sitting there that looked like kind of guys like we would know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, there's and, a look. Uh, yeah. There's a look. So I just went up and started talking to him and they were like, yeah, I'm an SF guy out of 10th group. And then another SF guy out of, I, I think they're actually, they're all out of 10th group because nice. they were, they had done a combat rotation in Afghanistan together. And uh, every one of those guys had started a business. They had gotten nice. out and started a business, and every one of them referenced our company in that, in, nice. in that which was I got out and I started a business. One of the guys owns a, a flower shop okay. in Springfield, Missouri. The other wow. guy was running an a excavator or um, excavation business. You know, the other guy was doing photography, and, mm. and he's like, yeah, every one of those guys was like, hey, I saw what you guys did. I went out and started a business. No, like, that's fucking great, man. Force that's multiplier. Awesome. It's like, you know, like that's the whole yeah. game for us. And yeah. like, that's kind of what fires me up and keeps me going. It's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not about, it's not about me anymore. Right. It's like, it's a big, it's a big machine. It's a, it's a big machine that has to keep rolling and it has to keep doing what, it, what it's actually meant to do, which is reinvesting in the community. Obviously, you know, I, I, I say that, but it's like, it's meant to have a high quality product that can in turn. Yeah. You have to have the product portion of the proceeds. You have back to have to the, the product. Community. It has to be the best, no yeah. matter what people get into when they, when they get out or even if they're not getting out, if they're starting a company, that product still has to be the best, regardless of those supporting efforts, that product has to be the best still. as it possibly and has to improve over time. Um, that, I think that part remains the same. And, uh, man, I, I've kept you way over time, huh. but, uh, oh. I do want to ask, uh, before we wrap things up, what my favorite book is other than <laughs> <laughs> I already know the answer, uh, right there. It's on the bag right there. Um, <laughs> but, um, when other than, Hey, it's possible get out there and, and do it other than, than that. Um, I know people are coming to you and asking you all sorts of advice and people want to ask you things, but might not have the access yeah, to yeah. be able to ask you these things. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what do you pass along when people are asking you or asking you for advice or oh, dude. The, the pick your brain thing same, or whatever it is? Dude, what is it, it is the same. Like it is the same. Like, I don't know how many guys have asked me about selection, right? Mm. It's like, what, what's your key to passing selection or whatever? I'm like, don't, don't quit and quit. <laughs> right. Like, and it's like, what's, what's the key to business? Don't quit. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's the same. It's the same regardless. Like I, I, I've gone through like hellacious, like, like what I would say is like way more psychological and emotional uh, issues in business than I ever have in, in, uh, in combat. Oh uh, yeah. Com and it, it is, it never, from from my perspective, one, the lesson is always the same, and, it, and you have to be, you have to be taught this lesson. Sometimes every week, sometimes every month, you know, maybe every year, which is, don't quit. And then the other piece is, it's you have to triage everything all the time, mm -hmm. and 
what people don't understand is like, I, I don't understand what you mean. What do you, what do you mean triage? Well, is it triage your time. And when, you, when you're triaging your time and not quitting, that means you're bucketing your energy and the things that yield you the highest mm-hmm. return. So for me, like the things that return the highest amount of fulfillment are my business and my family. So that's what makes me like, to be fair, I guess I'm fairly selfish because if I triage my time and then invest my time and energy into my family and my business, it returns the highest reward. Mm. And when you say, okay, well, I'm going to triage my time and I'm going to spend most of, of what returns my, 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 my ROI and my family, it's not sitting on your fucking phone, right? It's putting your phone down. It's connecting with my kids it's reading my kids' stories. Like last night, I, I spent an hour filming skits with my kids nice. with my phone, like just going back and forth and then working at an editor. And it was super fun, man. They loved it. They, they were like over the moon. My two little girls were like over the moon with this just little thing yeah. of me making skits with them in iMovie yeah. for an hour. And I know so many CEOs and executives in... You know, guys that think they have to be just plugged in to their phones 20 hours a day. Mm-hmm. Man, you're, you're not going to be on your deathbed asking for another, you know, another minute of time in a boardroom. But you will be asking for another minute of time with your kids, yeah. with your wife. And the business works the same way, which is if you chop out all the white noise. And by the way, it's going to be a chaotic mess. And, you know, much, much like life. And if you turn down the volume yeah. and turn up, you know, the squelch is what I, what I like to use because I'm a comms guy. It's like, squelch it out, man. Like, stop paying attention to the white noise. Mm. I used to, to have this conversation a lot over the last year, the several years is soft guys, I don't know what, what their deal is, but, you know, guys just in general, like they get, they get caught up in drama because drama is really easy. And if they stop getting caught up in drama and they just mm. really invest their time in work. Mm. The things that are going to yield you your highest return. Yeah. Man, you're going to reap the rewards. Yeah. And don't quit. Triage your time. Holy shit. <laughs> like, you know, man, it's going to start taking care of itself. It really yeah. does. And I think about that in terms of uh, not just starting a business, but just people in general, humans in general, citizens in general, that time that you have that you don't, and you don't know when it's ending. You don't know how much time you have, yeah. but uh, people on their deathbed saying, I wish I'd left one more bad Amazon review on another yeah. book. Like I wish I'd written <laughs> one more paragraph and really gotten that one in there. Like, I don't know if that's really what you're going to be saying. I mean, well, maybe may if you're really like into it, I guess that's your thing. Yeah. And I, I think that's the one thing that combat has really helped me understand is it puts things into perspective right? It's one, we know that this thing's going to end. Like, I think that we all, like we, we, we definitely, it's never lost on me that the time here that we have is really, it, it's fleeting and it's very special. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there's, there are things that I think about every day in that context, which is there, you know, my, my two closest friends were killed within a, a few months of each other. And there is very, very few nights that I don't give my kids a kiss and a hug and think about how they don't get to do that with their kids. And it makes, it forces me to be a better father. It forces me to be plugged in more effectively in my business. It forces me to try to be more present because I know that the lights can go out on this thing and they will eventually. And I'm not going to be there in the last minute of my life or the last 30 seconds thinking, fuck, I should have done X, Y, and Z. You know why? Because I'm not going to leave anything on the table. I don't every day. Like I don't, I I don't go to bed every day thinking like, man, I should have done X, Y, and Z Mm -hmm. because I do it. And I think that's the most important thing for me is you wring the sponge out. Like, like when, when the lights go off for me, dude, I'm wringing every last drop out of this thing. Like yeah. I always talk about this in the context of like, I, I run this thing in the red all the time. Like I, I have a, you know, fairly, you know, a, a childlike frame at 160 pounds and, a, and maybe a smaller <laughs> brain. Like I, this thing's running at a high RPM all the time. I'm going to get every last bit out of this go-kart. And, and, it, and a lot of times I feel like I'm, I'm a go-kart running on a formula one track. Right. It's like, get it all dude. But 
like there's not going to be an acquisition at the end of the at the end of the time mm. that I didn't try to get every last fucking drop out of it. Man, love it. I think that might be a good place to end cool. it because. I've kept you way Oh, past. man. It's awesome. But you know what? We'll do this again and uh, at some point. And because uh, and I, I have a ton more questions that'll keep us here for, for hours. I but uh, let's go sling Thanks, some arrows. Let's go and, do it. Uh, man, hey, thank you again for, uh, for everything. Thank you. I appreciate it. Later, brother. See you, buddy. Black Rifle Coffee Company. You can help Black Rifle Coffee raise $1 million to benefit veterans through the boot campaign. All you need to do is grab a can of ready-to-drink coffee online or from your local grocery or convenience store. The Boot Campaign is one of the most renowned veteran-focused nonprofits in the country, working tirelessly to provide life-changing aid and benefits to service members and their families. Join forces with Black Rifle in the Boot Campaign from May through the end of the year, where every can of ready-to-drink coffee you buy will contribute to making this massive donation possible. Black Rifle Ready to Drink Coffee is available in several great tasting flavors on the Black Rifle Coffee website at your local convenience or grocery store. And no matter where you are, you can fuel your caffeine fix while supporting veterans. Every time you crack open a can of Ready to Drink, you'll be making a huge difference in the lives of veterans and their families. Black Rifle Coffee is committed to serving the veteran community. And with your help, we can all continue to make a difference. Let's raise a can together to keep fueling Americans for a good cause. Check out blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose and use code dangerclose20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose. Drink up. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. First off, thank you to Badass Workbench. This is one of their works of art, essentially. This thing is solid. Badass-workbench.com. Check them out. Desks, workbenches, tables. And this thing is solid. I love these drawers on this thing. And it has four seats that all swivel out and back in. And just a great company. So check them out. Badass-workbench.com. And Fort Knox safes. Love this thing over here had it for about a year now they're down in the salt lake city area and you might have noticed one in the amazon prime video adaptation of the terminal list with chris pratt going in and out of it but that's just a beautiful safe and uh absolutely love it so four knocks thank you guys so much and check this out right here so safari land and haley strategic travis haley they uh collaborated on this it's the incog x right here and this is an inside the waistband appendix carry right here magazine pistol right there and it is slick so uh thank you guys and once again safari land haley strategic check them both out and uh, check out the new incog X. All right. Who Sig. Look at this right here. So this is the MPX right here. Feel very John Wickish when you are rocking one of these things. And this right here is nine mil. And check that out. I need to put uh, an optic on there. Maybe some iron sling light, but uh, whew, this is a slick setup. MPX. I think everybody needs one of these bad boys right here so sig thank you so much check them out sigsour.com all right this oh let's go to this black rifle coffee company exclusive coffee subscription check them out blackriflecoffee.com veteran founded here we go and this is the fire fox cart look at that right there and this one just open in this box it smells really good waking me up right here. So Black Rifle Coffee fueling me through this next book, book number seven that I'm working on right now. Comes with a sticker if you're part of the club. And this tells you how to make it, the different ways that you can make your coffee. So Black Rifle Coffee Company, check them out for sure. And yeah, in this club, you get a different bag every month. So thank you guys. Cool. All right. This right here, Simon & Schuster, Atria, Emily Bessler books. Um, thank you guys. Look at this right here. Amazing. This just came in the mail yesterday. And this is from the New York Times. So New York Times number one in hardcover, in combined print, ebook, and in audio. So thank you, Simon and Schuster, Emily Bessler, Emily Bessler Books, Atria, and all the readers and listeners that made this happen. It just uh man means so 
so much to me. It means the world. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Emily, for sending this along. It is going to go in a very special spot. So thank you. Incredible. And speaking of only the dead, what is this? Amazing. So this arrived. Oh, man, Cabot Guns. Be sure and give them a follow on the social channels and check them out, cabotguns.com. Rob, thank you so much for sending this. This thing in and of itself is a work of art, as are their pistols. And check that out. So, oh, this is one of a kind and just beyond cool. Let's see here. So open this thing up. Let's see. I'll do it like this. Like that. And these very heavy-duty magnets hold this on. That's the back. Right there, um, incredible, solid right there. And inside, I put my Apocalypse. And if you've been reading the novels, you know that this is featured. Whew, look at that, that's the Apocalypse right there. Whew, awesome. And it fits right here, once again, heavy duty magnets. And right there, fits inside like that. I mean, so thoughtful. Um, and Rob, thank you so much. Cabot Guns, thank you guys so much. This is just, just incredible. So, and then, yeah, back it goes like this. Magnets, again, holding that in place. And there it is. Cabot Guns have a few of their pistols now. Absolutely love them. Check them out and uh, yeah, spend some time on that website. And man, um, thank you so much for this. This is just incredible. Thank you out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Evan Hafer, be sure and follow him on Instagram at Evan Hafer, and that is E-V-A-N-H-A-F-E-R. And be sure to check out Black Rifle Coffee, subscribe to a coffee club, and that is blackriflecoffee.com. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA, officialjackcar.com. That is the website. You can click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting. <laughs>